The member for Darling Ranges. Madam Acting Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to address the members of the Legislative Assembly. On my first occasion rising in this great chamber as a member for Darling Range. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wadjuk people from the Noongar Nation, and I wish to pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and future. It is with great privilege and honour to be elected by the people of Darling Range, and I will do my best to represent their interests here in Parliament. I wish to pay tribute to the Darling Range campaign team. My campaign directors, uh, Matt Keogh, Federal Member for Burt, uh, Dr Tony Booty, um, Member for Armadale, my campaign manager, Callan Tree, uh, and my uh, field organiser, Harrison Burrow, uh, and my special helpers from the East, Ethan Stein, John McManus, and Lucy Collier. With the assistance of many local volunteers from our community, rank and file members from the CFMEU, the MUA, the AMWU, ASU, ETU, the TWU, the AWU and the United Voice. We engage in an energetic and professional campaign talking to thousands of Darlin Range residents. We listen to their concerns and aspirations, and I come to this place motivated and committed to addressing my community's concerns and seeking to release their aspirations. I was fortunate to receive outstanding assistance and support from many of my parliamentary colleagues, including the Premier, who, the, as the leader of our party, visited Darling Range many times before, during uh, sorry, before and during the election campaign, like me, the Premier is committed to improving all lives in my, for my constituents and the lives for all Australian, West Australians. I must make special mention to uh, Matthew Swinburne, without the E, uh, the newly elected Upper House Member for East Metropolitan. He was, without doubt, a confidant and a great boost to my personal morale on days when it was tough. He was with me every single step of the way during the campaign. Uh, I thank you, Matt, and I, look, and I much look forward to working with you as we seek to improve the life of the people in my constituent. Oh, sorry, my electorate. I'm truly grateful for the friendship and support I have along the way. Uh, from Phil Eva, who's not here today, uh, Dave Elliott, uh, Mark Eela, uh, Wayne Eden, Ron Mellership, Yazzie, of course, uh, John Kirkpatrick, and Shell Rich. You were there when I needed you the most. The community of Darlin Range, like the rest of the state, have given the McGowan Labour government a clear mandate to stop the privatisation of Western power. On this front, our campaign on this, our campaign on this issue was well supported by Wayne Woods and the ASU sorry, on the ASU team, and Les McLaughlin from the ETU team. Thank you for such a great campaign, and thank you for your strong personal support. Madam Acton Speaker, my brother John was not able to be here today, uh, as he lives in the UK. Um, he amazes me, I'm gonna cry now, so just accept it. <laughs> um, he amazes me in so many ways. Um, we were in the best regiment and battery together, which I'll go into a bit later. We grew up with love, hatred, hard times and good times, and we've remained the best friends. We are so close to each other, and even though the distance separates us, um, we keep in regular contact through Skype um, with uh, my niece, Larissa, and her son, Ryan. Uh, my brother works long hours in the southeast of England as an installs manager for a central heating company. Um, on his downtime, he spends lots of time um, raising money for the British Cancer Foundation. He's emerged as one of the major events organisers for Front Runs, Relay for Lives and Tough Mudder events uh, around the UK. He's been known to wear pink with pride. Uh, he wears tutus quite regular. 
and attacks competitors with water pistols. All this he does to raise awareness for one of the biggest causes of death in our communities. The big C has taken so many of our friends and family members far too early. Our great friend Doug Fagg, only his mid-40s, is fighting this illness. Every day I think of him, Donna and the family, and he'll always be my prayers. Um, this next bit's going to be hard. Um, finally, thank you to my family, Rosemary or the old bat, Lachlan, Nathan, Jack, and our adopted daughter, Tanya, and all my friends' families across, uh, who, who are in the UK, Australia, and Canada. Some are watching actually on the internet, so uh, supposed to be rough and tough, aren't they? Uh, right. Uh, to my wife, Jen, who has supported me through all my craziness and all the years. Uh, we do all the mad things together. We ride motorbikes. Uh, we put on wetsuits and dive to the most amazing locations around Australia uh, and around the world. Uh, we both love travelling and uh, meeting people from different customs and cultures. I can't understand why she refuses to join me by the parachute, not base diving, she, she just won't do it. Um, she has supported me through my time as a counsellor in Serpentine, Jaredale, and single-handedly, she has kept our family together. I can never thank her enough. Today is a day I will never forget. I've just crossed over my 18th year of living here in Australia. It's been an eventful journey, and let's go back a little over 48 years. I was born in a coal mine village called Ashington in Northumberland. My father was a coal miner, and my mother was an auxiliary nurse for a local mental hospital. My brother and I had a mixed and very, a varied upbringing. We were like many other families, not well off. My parents saved all year to take a holiday, often take personal loans, to pay for our trips. Our upbringing was like most other kids in the northeast of England. It was full of, it was a mixture of mischief and adventure. My love for judo and rugby started in Ashington, where I represented the local area in both sports. I'm forever grateful for the people like Ronnie Chucky Morris and Davy Garrett, rest, may he rest in peace, who introduced discipline and a compassion to many kids who entered the dojo. Even if we were not in a financial position to pay the fees, we were always welcome, and we were always made to feel welcome. When I was a kid in the Northeast, when I was a kid, Northeast communities centered on the local coal mines. Kids left school to work down the pit in many varied roles. They started a change in the 1980s under the Thatcher government. The Tories attacked the heart of the union and working class and the communities. Workers' rights, workers' conditions and wages were all un under attack, even though productivity was at its highest. This was a direct assault on my community. The 1984 miners' strike consolidated our community behind the National Union of Mine Workers. Throughout the year, throughout the, the, the year-long strike, my family saw struggles financially, and uh, my personal family endured that too. Houses were being repossessed, families were falling apart, the Thatcher government broke the once proud mining communities of the northeast of England. Some of us, some of them have never recovered. Families were torn apart as men stepped over the picket lines, against the will of their brothers and sisters, and to save their families from further humiliation. Some men killed themselves as they thought life would be better for their families if they weren't there. Others ended up with criminal records, as they were committing offences in order to put food on the table for the families. My family survived on food parcels from strangers and handouts from family, friends and family. 
The strike concluded in early 1985 with promises of better working conditions, better workers' rights and fairer wages. These promises were broken by the Thatcher government and pits were closed down at alarming rates. In 1986, the last mine was closed in my area and the community as I knew it no longer exists. Where I came from, there was not a lot of opportunities available. With the closures of the mines, it was pretty much the dole or commencing a year, a career in petty crime, with some ending up being placed in Her Majesty's pleasure at Durham or Acklington, which are prisons. Although there was another option, which was the military. My brother joined the military, uh, the army in 1983, while I was still in high school. I had a great time at Hurst High School. I was an average student, getting average qualifications. We weren't supposed to amount to much. However, we were fortunate to have some great teachers, and there were three particular encouraged to break the mold and achieve the best we could. Brian Hannaford, Sheila Harrison, and uh, Lynn Mills became men as mentors for so many of us kids and made a real difference in my life. At school, I forged friendships that have stood the test of time. Don and Doug kindly. Uh, of course, my second parents, Dot and Liz. Uh, Steve Pert and Kev Horwood. Our friendship has been over 40 years long. On the 17th of June, 1985, I left school. And 10 days later, I was on the train to the Junior Leaders Regiment Royal Artillery. Later, I became a member of the 3rd Regiment Royal Horse Artillery, the mighty J City Rizé Battery. This is where I learned the true meaning of mateship. We worked hard, played even harder. We backed each other and we, support, and we supported each other through many situations. My regimental colleagues remain loyal friends to this day and I remain loyal to them. Rob Jock Donahue, Sheds, Jimmy Hilton, Taflaff, Scouse Burton, of course, my brother John, and many, many more. I apologize for not naming you, but uh, I probably need an extension sometime anyway. I stand in this chamber, proudly wearing my regimental tie, in respect to you all. Thank you to Jerry Herbert, RHA retired, and Alec Jock Downey for your wisdom and advice. Madam Acting Speaker, in 1989, my police life commenced. Again, it was with huge sense of pride I spent time with Hertfordshire Constabulary, the West Midlands Police, and later the West Australian Police. Almost 24 years in total. In the police force, I met some of the most important mentors in my life, such as Tom Kennedy, PC607, uh, and his wife Anne, Ian Langdon, Ian Herbert, and uh, Mick McCarthy. Uh, he later transpired, he came to West Australia Police and uh, can't get rid of the big Irishman. The police force supported me through university twice, to which I will be eternally grateful. I've, I have stated to my police and lawyer mates in the UK, I will somehow introduce the words penguin and iceberg into my speech and I'll just see what I can do. Following a period of time investigating atrocities that humans do to each other in the, the Balkans, in late 1998, I left the British police. To get a clear understanding of my personal journey, my life and outlook on life changed. I travelled the world, caught up with a, a long-term friend in Rockingham, Willie Bugles, Bugie. I am. He has supported me through so much, and, uh, and I've achieved so much in life with his and his wife Leslie's support, including their introduction to my wife. Madam Acting Speaker, it is with, with reflection and a sense of balance that I see the suffering people endure on a daily basis. I have spent much time of my, uh, much of my adult life defending and fighting for people who cannot fight themselves. As a police officer, 
I have defended and supported victims of crime, victims of assault, and victims of domestic-related incidents and their families. I will continue to defend vulnerable people in our community. There are many issues police officers face on a daily basis. We expect a lot from them. We expect our men and women in blue to run towards danger when everybody else runs away. They see tragedy, loss of loss and life-saving moments more than the average person in our community. So it should be a no-brainer that we look after our police officers, both their mental well-being and financially if they can no longer work due to a psychological injury. The health and well-being of our police officers should be an absolute priority. Although there are no official stat statistics, we know that in the past three years, three West Australian police officers have tragically taken their own lives. Three is simply too many. One is too many. Sadly, it was February this year, a senior constable took her life, leaving behind a young son. Police officers on the front line still saying that the lack of accountability for the unsupportive and often dismiss dismissive attitude of the agency following a trauma-related incident and work-acquired medical issues, particularly those with a psychological nature. They agree that there is an ad hoc approach to mental health training and awareness. Oh, sorry, mental health training and awareness. And a, and a pervasive police culture that sees illnesses and injuries, particularly those with a psychological nature, as a weakness. This combined with a perceived lack of support from management or hierarchy exuberates the prosperity, the propensity for officers to suffer in silence. Our police, our police officers should feel valued and supported for the work that they do in our community and not a burden. Madam, can I have an extension, please? Extension granted. Thank you. They also should not be a medically, they also should not be medically retired through the same process as officers who, are, who have been accused of misconduct or, or corruption. The WA Labour government has committed to change the medical retirement process to ensure officers can leave WA police with dignity and respect. The WA Police Union has campaigned for workers' compensation style scheme for medically retired officers, and the WA Labour government has undertaken to sit down and talk with key stakeholders about provi uh, providing financial compensation for officers who give their all to support our community. Policing is a difficult and dangerous job. A career end in illness or injury can occur anywhere and at any time, even when they're not on duty. Police officers are the only workers who are agents of the Crown. As such, police officers are never off duty due to the oath of office and common law responsibi responsibility to uphold the law. If police officers are injured but still able to work, the current system is very good. But if an officer is deemed medically unfit, it can leave them and their family destitute. It not only affects the officer, but also has a profound impact on their immediate family. This can mean things losing the family home, bankruptcy, a breakdown of the family relationship, loss of self-worth, depression, or worse. But a scheme to rectify this is a priority for this government. And I want to help the rights, I want to help the rights, the wrongs of medical retired officers. Uh, I want to keep them off the scrap heap and give them a, the respect they deserve. Crabman Ryan Marin, I've got your back. For the past three years, I've been working in the area of youth justice. 
in the South West Metro under the management of Claire Heffernan, Diane Rayner and Stephanie McPherson. Youth justice officers across the state have an enormous responsibility of trying to assist young offenders by helping them integrate into the community and hopefully break the cycle of reoffending. And I'm not forgetting you, Renee, so don't stress. Looking at the issues, youth, uh, looking at the, the issues of youth in the Peel region, what they face on a daily basis, there are five recurrent themes. There are trouble with the family, friends who are engaged in criminal behaviour, disengagement from school, a disconnection from the community, personal issues including drug and alcohol, and cognitive disorders and mental health issues. Methamphetamine and alpha PVP, which is a synthetic drug known as a zombie drug, is the worst drug to hit our communities. These drugs have been used by children as young as 11 on a daily basis. These drugs are destroying families in so many ways. Offences committed by these offenders are not just stealing or damage, but are also assaults or domestic violence. Many young people are exposed to drug and alcohol use in the home, and they feel encouraged to use drugs themselves. A lack of money and the absence of basic needs such as food, clothing and housing are commonly identified as reasons for young people getting into trouble. Many young people describe describes stealing as a means of getting money for things that they need. Many not-for-profit agencies are working with youth people in the Peel region. Peel Youth Services, the Peel Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, the Peel Youth Medical Services, Shelter WA, Fairbridge, Palmerston, Smile, Community First, to name but a few. These agencies work tirelessly to support these in our community that need support. As a government, we must do better in supporting government agencies and not-for-profit organisations towards achieving better outcomes for these youth who are at risk. Whilst a member of this chamber, I will be advocating for this section of our community that needs a voice here. I want to acknowledge the 24,000 West Australians living with epilepsy and the challenges that they face every day. Epilepsy is the most common brain disorder in the world and yet sufferers often feel vulnerable, frustrated and isolated. They can face many limits to their independence, restricted opportunities, discrimination, stigmatism, and impacts on their health and well-being. Epilepsy WA continues to provide them with support to achieve a better outcome and a better quality of life and raise community awareness about this condition. I'm sure you agree that people with epilepsy deserve consideration by us both the government and in the community, to be given a fair go and, a f and feel well supported. The electorate of Darlin Range is a special place. The community pulls together in so many ways, whether it's the Heritage Society in both Jarradale and Pickering Brook, the many community groups, or the wonderful Bush Volunteer Fire Services. Our community is strong and committed to the hills and foothills, as the, people, as the people are aware, my, as people are aware, my wife and I, uh, and our eldest son Lachlan, are active members of the Jarradale Brigade. Like all brigades in this state, we are in debt to many people in our community who volunteer whatever capacity they can. WA Labour has made a number of key commitments the extension of the train line to, um, from Armadale to Byford, the transfer of land to the Serpentine Jarradale Shire for the regional sports facility in Whitby, to the many grant allocation to numerous community groups. I will be working hard to ensure my community benefits from future infrastructure projects and job opportunities. 
Finally, Madam Acting Speaker, as you can see, there are many things in my life that I cherish. It's true, like Mr. Member for Armadale, we are Docker supporters. <laughs> Western Force is my rugby team alongside Newcastle Falcons, and I'm an avid Newcastle United supporter. At the end of the 2015-2016 se uh, season, Newcastle were relegated from the Premier League to the Championship League. The season they stood proud behind their manager Rafa Benitez and thousands of fanatical Geordies to win the Championship League ahead of Brighton on the final day. So next season, the Toon Army will represent the northeast of England in football's top division as both Sunderland and Middlesbrough have been relegated. <laughs> With my electorate officers, I, took, I look forward to kicking some strategic goals uh, in, for the people of Darlin Range. I will do my best to ensure the people of Darlin Range, my constituents, my community are strongly represented in this place. I am committed to doing this. This is why I stood as a Labour candidate for Darlin Range in 2013 and again in 2017. I was unsuccessful in 2013, and I wish to note the contribution made by the former men member for Darlin Range, Tony Simpson. But fortunately, 2017 was my day. And here I am, the proud local member for Darlin Range in the Legislative Assembly with a Geordie accent. I will work so hard not to, dis to disappoint my electorate and to improve the quality of life for our community. Thank you.